On this edition for Sunday, March 4th, the Trump administration defends proposed tariffs on steel and aluminum. Also, a new report on the lack of federal data on gun policy. And in our signature segment, the legacy of war photographer Chris Hondros. Next on PBS NewsHour Weekend. From the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center in New York, Hari Srinivasan. Good evening and thanks for joining us. White House officials today defended President Trump's proposed tariffs on steel and aluminum, along with the decision not to exempt any countries from the tariffs. That's despite criticism from some of America's closest allies. National Trade Council Director Peter Navarro argued the proposed 25 percent tariff on steel and 10 percent tariff on aluminum are necessary to defend national security and domestic industry. Okay. The mission is to defend our steel and aluminum industries so that they survive. And as the president said clearly and correctly, we can't have a country without a steel and aluminum okay. industry. Okay. Navarro also said there could be some situations where companies might be able to get exemptions from the tariffs, but that will not be extended to entire countries. As soon as he starts exempting countries, he has to raise the tariff on everybody else. As soon as he exempts one country, his phone starts ringing from the heads of state of other countries. Today, a spokesperson for British Prime Minister Theresa May says she spoke with President Trump on the phone and raised, quote, deep concern about the tariffs. Also, the European Union is considering retaliatory measures against products like Harley-Davidson motorcycles, Kentucky bourbon, and Florida orange juice. Today, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross downplayed those potential actions. Well, in our size economy, that's a tiny, tiny fraction of 1%. So while it might affect an individual producer for a little while, Overall, it's not going to be much more than a rounding error. But some members of President Trump's own party are questioning the plan. Ohio's Republican Governor John Kasich said the decision didn't make much sense. It would be like me going home tonight and having dinner with my family and saying, girls, I sold the house today. I mean, it, you just don't do things like that off the cuff. Josh Bolton, CEO of the lobbying group Business Roundtable and former chief of staff to President George W. Bush, argued the tariffs will negatively impact the economy in the long run. This will cause huge damage across broad sectors of the economy. Um, you maybe will be able to give a little bit of help to the steel and aluminum industries. You're going to cause damage across any number of downstream industries. The new tariffs might be rolled out as early as this week. Significant political developments in both Italy and Germany tonight. Early exit polls show voting in Italy is quite close. Former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi's alliance of parties is expected to win several seats, but not the majority needed to control the government. The Five Star Movement, with an anti-immigration and anti-European Union platform, is also securing many votes, but also not enough to govern alone. And after months of wrangling, Angela Merkel will get a fourth term as Germany's chancellor. Germany's Social Democratic Party voted to form a coalition government with her conservative bloc. This leaves the far-right AFD party as the main opposition in parliament. Unless West Virginia's legislature passes a last-minute fix, the statewide teacher strike is set to stretch into an eighth day tomorrow. The teachers' unions are demanding a 5% pay raise to help cover the soaring costs of health insurance. The state House approved a 5% raise yesterday, but the state Senate only passed a 4% raise. A state senator who supports the raise estimates the 1% difference could cost $13 million. There's also concern on whether the state can afford the raises based on projected revenue. West Virginia's 20,000 teachers are some of the lowest paid educators in the country. There is also word from Oklahoma. The teachers in Tulsa and Oklahoma City held talks on Friday about walking off the job if they don't receive a pay raise. If a strike occurs there, teachers are considering April during standardized testing season. It's nearly time for the Academy Awards tonight, and this year one of the top predictions is that entertainment and politics will be sharing center stage. Previous Oscar winners Casey Affleck and Kevin Spacey will be notably absent after facing allegations of sexual harassment and abuse. Host Jimmy Kimmel has used his talk show to address issues like health care and gun control. Tonight, he'll be speaking to a much larger audience. And when it comes to the big awards, there's plenty of speculation about who will walk away with the top Oscars. On Facebook Live earlier today, I spoke with Vulture's Hunter Harris about why the prediction game is particularly difficult this year. 
you can see that you know younger voters are on Twitter. They're really clued in and plugged into online conversations and critiques and criticism. Um, where older voters weren't. Even the way that we that you vote for Oscars has changed. It used to be a paper ballot. Now you can vote online until you know. I think voting closed early this week. Um, so those shifts will make a huge, huge difference in what we're seeing. Following last year's Best Picture flub, but an envelope mix-up led to Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty announcing the wrong winner, Oscars producers are giving them a do-over. They've been asked again to hand out the night's biggest prize. Read a conversation with the director of The Insult, Lebanon's first Oscar-nominated film, on pbs.org slash newshour. In Washington and in states across the nation, policymakers are debating responses to last month's school shooting in Parkland, Florida. But how much do we really know about the effects of gun laws? It turns out, not much. The Rand Corporation, a nonprofit think tank, spent two years studying which facts that could affect gun policy are available and which facts are not. I'm joined now from Washington, D.C. by Andrew Morrell, senior behavioral scientist at the Rand Corporation who helped lead the study. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. So, how much do we know? Well, we spent two years trying to figure out uh, what the science says about this, trying to identify the most reliable scientific evidence for the effects of about 13 different common gun laws on a whole range of outcomes of concern to different stakeholders in gun policy debates. And I think the bottom line, uh, the biggest finding we have is that there's not been a great deal of research done yet uh, that looks at the uh, effects of these laws. You know, there's going to be several folks on the left that point to the Dickey Amendment. This was something that happened back in 1996. Essentially, in the part of an omnibus bill, there's a, a clause en uh, entered in there. It says, none of the funds made available to in for injury prevention and control at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention may be used to advocate or promote gun control. How big of an effect has that had, that the government can't particularly study this? Well, I, it looks like it has had an effect. There was a study uh, last year by David Stark and Nigam Shah that uh, estimated that uh, the government spends only about 2% as much on gun violence research as it does on uh, research for other causes of mortality that kill about the same numbers of people, like liver disease or traffic accidents or sepsis. Uh, and as a result, of course, the, uh, the number of publications that come out in this area are very low. They, said, uh, they estimated it was only 4% as much uh, research uh, mm -hmm. uh, re reports coming out uh, compared to those other types of mortality. All right, with the studies that do exist that you were able to take a look at, you set out to see what evidence there was about the effects of certain gun policies. For instance, taking a look at background checks, something being debated right now, you found there is inconclusive evidence about their effects on mass shootings and only moderate evidence that they decrease suicide and violent crime. And you found no evidence that they affect a variety of other things like officer-involved shootings or unintentional deaths. What else did you find and what does this tell you about the lack of data around guns? Yeah, and actually those, uh, the, the moderate evidence that we uh, rated the effects of background checks on suicide and, and violent crime was actually uh, among the few uh, more, more significant uh, or more um, credible uh, ratings of evidence that we were able to give across all these outcomes. Uh, so uh, the, the strongest evidence we found was for um, child access prevention laws. Uh, but uh, even there, it's a relatively small number of studies, and uh, so we don't, uh, we don't think that there is uh, enough evidence right now to make very strong claims. You know, you, you, you point out that there's, as you say, that there's not that much research being done, that there's not so many direct lines you can draw. Your report also underscores how the different sides of the gun control debate come to different kind of interpret these conclusions about the same effects on these gun laws. For instance, when you asked experts on the pro-gun control side of the debate about the effects of instituting universal background checks, they estimated that this could decrease firearm homicides by 8%. But when you asked experts who oppose gun control, they think background checks would have no effect at all. What explains this difference? Well, actually, I think a lot of the differences between the two sides in this debate come down to uh, different ideas about the, the true effects of, of gun policies. And that's why, uh, that's why we focused on that in this uh, study and, and why we think uh, more research that could answer these questions more definitively would be useful to uh, resolving some of these longstanding debates. All right, Andrew Morrell of the Rand Corporation. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Hari.
On April 20, 2011, while on assignment in Libya, war photographers Chris Hondros and Tim Hetherington were killed by a Libyan military mortar attack. While the world lost two great war photographers, filmmaker Greg Campbell lost a lifetime friend. In his new documentary, Hondros, Campbell has not only created a tribute to his friend, but an in-depth look at the legacy of conflict photography. NewsHour Weekend's Christopher Booker has more. It's the calmness of his voice that's perhaps the most striking. Hello, Chris. Hello, Chris. As young men fire AK-47s in the streets of Monrovia, Liberia, with the steadiest of nerve, 33-year-old Chris Hondros is able to politely tell the caller, now is not a good time to talk. Things are fine. Things are fine. Uh, let, me, let me give me a call back in about half an hour. As soon as I heard it, I knew we were going to open the film with that because it's, it was just so representative of who he was, how cool and collected he was in these extremely turbulent environments. Chris Hondros would spend a great deal of time photographing the final moments of Liberia's civil war in 2003. One of the final battles was fought on this bridge where he would take one of his most famous photographs. Something clicked in me at that moment when I was thinking about it and just as they were about to charge. You know, I kind of realized at that moment that my whole career as a photographer in a way had been leading up to a moment like that and that the picture was on the bridge. It wasn't 50 feet away from the middle of the bridge. It was on the bridge. There was no shortcut to that. This image of a Liberian commander would land in newspapers and magazines across the globe and Chris Hondros would establish himself as one of the world's preeminent conflict photographers. That one particularly famous image of the government commander jumping for joy after having scored a direct hit with a rocket-propelled grenade is the one that really sort of propelled him to, to the top. For the next eight years, Hondros and his camera offered a window to some of recent history's darkest moments in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Egypt, and Libya. He would be nominated for the Pulitzer Prize twice. But the documentary Hondros is not just a retrospective of his work, it's a portrait of a friendship that began in high school in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Hondros and director Greg Campbell's love of journalism started together during their freshman year. Hondros as a photographer, Campbell as a writer. With journalism, we found sort of a real easy route to go see history as it was being made. My first trip was to Bosnia during the reunification of Sarajevo in 1996. And Chris picked me up from the airport when I came back, and his immediate question was, how did you do it? What were the steps? Uh, what hotel did you stay in? How did you figure out a car? He wanted to do this work. He believed in it with all of his heart. He was pretty clear-eyed about what it meant. What Campbell's film follows is not only the breadth of this work, but a connection between all the photographs that Hondros took. Looking from the very beginning, from when he first started photographing conflicts in Kosovo, all the way up to the very end, Chris had a particular framing theme that he that is evident in his entire body of work. It was always a little child, a, a, either a boy or girl, who was in sharp relief against uh, sort of an anonymous military figure in the foreground. And of course you see that culminated in the series of images from Talifar. On January 18th, 2005, while embedded with American forces in Talifar, Iraq, Hondros would document an event that has come to help define the aftermath of the American invasion. I hear children's voices inside the car, and I knew it was a family. Back doors open, and just kids just tumble out of the car, just one after one after one. There were six in all. And the parents sitting in the front were just riddled with bullets and killed instantly. The Hassan family car had approached an American patrol. The soldiers opened fire as the car drove toward them. The mother and the father killed in front of their children. The bullet that hit 11-year-old Rakan pierced his spine. The photograph Hondros took of his sister, 5-year-old Samar Hassan, covered in her parents' blood, would be published across the world. Of course, as a human being, you want to drop all of your equipment and go run and, and, and comfort the people that you're seeing who are suffering so badly. Um, but Chris knew that his role was to, was to publicize the events that he was seeing. The photos Hondros took caused a public outcry. After they were published, the Army removed him from his embed assignment. Rakan was flown to Boston for treatment. Eventually, he learned to walk again. But in 2008, after returning to Iraq, Rakan was killed by an insurgent bombing. I can't say there were a lot of happy endings with some of the subjects of the photographs. You know, I think that was important for us to try to convey in the film, because I think Chris knew very well that there were also not a lot of happy endings after he 
snapped the shutter on his camera. And I've heard him say several times that as much as journalists and photographers are recording history, it's maybe more accurate to just say that they're recording a very narrow slice of history. And they're usually some of the most traumatic events of a person's life. And I think Chris really wanted to follow up with stories to try to present a, a wider picture of what, what occurred. In 2011, Campbell received a call from Hondros asking if he would like to join him on a reporting trip to Libya. In the past, he had mostly refused. But in a fateful decision, this time he opted to join him. We were in our hotel room in Benghazi, and he said the photojournalism industry was overdue for a tragedy, that it had been a long time that they'd gone without suffering a loss or a death. And that was true at that point. Um, the international photojournalism community had been extra extraordinarily lucky. And then maybe a week and a half later, Chris and Tim were killed one after another. Who do you think is the audience for this film? Well, I hope it's a, a wide audience. I think anybody, especially with the debate that we're having today about the validity of our profession. The thing that I really hope sort of resonates is that there's still responsible journalists and men and women who are putting their lives on the line to convey what is actually happening and that those images can and should inform a conversation that should lead to discussions about policy. This is sort of what Chris believed. Hondros is now playing in select theaters in New York, Los Angeles, and London. The opioid crisis continues to rage in this country. According to the CDC, overdoses kill an estimated 115 people every day. After declaring last October that the crisis is a public health emergency, the White House held a summit on the topic last week. It was attended by families, advocates, and administration officials. So what has the administration done to address this emergency to help answer that? I'm joined by Katie Zesma of The Washington Post. So well, what kind of progress has been made? I mean, it's been a few months since the White House said that this was a public health emergency. Well, it depends on who you ask. Um, you know, the White House said that they have taken steps to try to combat this epidemic, which, as you said, is, is killing uh, you know, tens of thousands of people a year. Um, you know, the White House has said that they have loosened rules to make it easier for people to get um, into treatment. They are going to come out with um, an, basically an ad campaign to let people know about how, uh, you know, how much this, this, uh, this epidemic is affecting the United States for people to, and, and allow people to um, you know, really tell their stories. Advocates, on the other hand, say that they really have not done that much. Um, cities and states still have not gotten money to help fight the crisis. Um, you know, advocates said a, a number of the things the White House want to do, want to do, you know, get more people into treatment, um, are all good things, but they haven't actually seen any measurable progress yet. Now, the White House also says they're going to have more policies on this. Um, are any of these critiques going to be addressed by that, or what, what else are they proposing? President Trump said that there's going to be more policies in the next couple of weeks, but he did not specify exactly what they are. So I think that still um, remains remains to be seen. You know, one of the things that they that they want to do and they have made some progress toward is lifting the cap on the number of people in residential treatment beds. Um, Congress actually has to change the law, but the administration is asking states to um, apply for waivers to to lift this cap so more people can can get um, can get treatment. You know, earlier last week, Attorney General Jeff Sessions also said that the Department of Justice wants to take part in going after some of the pharmaceutical companies. The president expressed support for that idea. Does it make a difference? Well, so what uh, what Attorney General Sessions wants to do is they filed a um, memorandum of interest in a very, very large lawsuit that is happening out of Cleveland. And what that lawsuit is, is hundreds and hundreds of, of cities and towns and counties and states and municipalities around the country have sued pharmaceutical companies. They all have very different claims, but all of these suits have been enjoined in this one um, mammoth lawsuit in Cleveland. So the Department of Justice filed um, you know, a motion of interest in this case. It remains to be seen as to whether they will actually join. And another thing that Attorney General Sessions did this past week is he ordered the, the DEA to look at production quotas for opioids. So that's actually quite a big deal, you know, seeing how many opioids are manufactured in the United States and whether it is too high. 
The president also made a remark at this particular event. Uh, he said some countries have a very, very tough penalty, ul the ultimate penalty. And by the way, they have much less of a drug problem than we do, so we're going to have to be very strong on penalties. Some people uh, interpreted that to be the death penalty for drug dealers. Well, the president said that there are certain countries where people pay the ultimate penalty. And he also said that, you know, people can get the death penalty here for killing one person and people, uh, certain drug dealers. I, it's, it seems as though he was talking about people who deal fentanyl can, can have the potential to kill thousands of people at once. Um, you know, I was told by someone in the White House, and uh, this has been reported by other people as well, that he um, saw what happened in Singapore, which has the, the death penalty for drug dealers, and he was interested in that, and that the White House is looking at this n idea of possibly making trafficking large amounts of fentanyl drugs, which can be very, very deadly and kill people instantly, um, a capital crime. In that uh, meeting, uh, the, uh, and after that meeting, what have the communities, the, the people who are advocating for reform, what have they been pushing for uh, that perhaps the White House is listening to or not listening to on how this crisis can be wrangled? I mean, I don't even want to say it's, been, it's going to be fixed or it's going to be solved anytime soon. So the thing about this crisis that that's so that that makes it so difficult is that every city and every town and really every person needs some needs something different in terms of whether he or she um, you know wants treatment at this time and how to help that person. So that's part of the reason why this this um, epidemic has been so difficult to solve. All right, Katie Zesma of the Washington Post joining us from Washington. Thanks so much. Thank you. Finally tonight, we remember Sir Roger Bannister, the first runner to break the four-minute mile barrier. While Bannister is best remembered for his accomplishments on the track, he said he is most proud of his long career as a neurologist. Roger Bannister was 88 years old. Tomorrow on the News Hour, Judy Woodruff sits down with two inspiring women taking a leading role shaping the future of Afghanistan. That's all for this edition of PBS News Hour Weekend. I'm Harry Srinivasan. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.